Hello and welcome to my set review for Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Now this is going to be a limited set review and I'm going to be going over each color. And we're gonna be starting here with white because of course, Wooberg. So we're gonna go white, blue, black, red, green, followed by the gold card. So today's video is gonna be all about the white cards and what my thought process is going to be for the power level of these cards in limited. And I wanted to keep the grading scale pretty simple. So I have the grades from a letter grade system from A through F and I'm gonna just take a look here. I wrote down the explanation. And basically, uh, A, just a bomb, right? Bomb, it's, it's a card that you're happy to first pick and you're gonna slam it. You could even potentially change colors in the second pack. Very, very high power level cards. Good examples of this in MKM are going to be Aurelius Vindicator, Izoni, and Cryptic Coat. The next here is gonna be B. B are just good cards. These are cards that you often first pick if you don't have a good rare that you open. Uh, you're basically never cutting these cards in your deck if you're on color and it should be cards you take very highly. Examples of this from MKM Draft include Torch the Witness, Neighborhood Guardian, and A Killer Among Us. Then the next tier is gonna be the C tier. Now these are the solid cards. These are gonna be the meat and potatoes of your deck. You're almost never cutting any of these cards from your deck unless your deck is completely absurd Car examples of cards like this are Nervous Gardener, Bite Down on Crime, Projector Inspector, and Murder. Moving on, we have D. Now, these are the filler cards. The, the, these can make your deck. Oftentimes, these cards are going to be your 22nd or 23rd card. You don't want to have a, your deck full of cards like this, but uh, oftentimes, you, you'll just have to play one or two copies in your deck. Examples of this are cards like Suspicious Detonation, Griff Not Tracker, and Shady Informant. And for any of you who think those cards are a little bit better, live your best life. Moving on, we have F tier. I don't have to go into this. Garbage cards. You never want to play these cards in your deck. If you have to play an F tier card, drop and draft again. That's, that's just where we're going to go. So we're going to start things off with the white cards here. Now, before I do start, I did want to say that if you've enjoyed this content so far, I did launch my Patreon channel. That's the best way to support this channel outside of, of course, hitting that subscribe button. The link to this description is in the description below. So shout out to all the current patrons. Thank you so much for your support. And let's get straight into the cards. Wait, actually, before we get into it, I did want to talk about the mechanics very, very quickly. Now we're going to go over the white cards. So not all the white cards are going to have these mechanics, but I just wanted to give you the introduction to Outlaws of Thunder Junction and kind of uh, what we're looking to expect. So the first one, and this is going to be very relevant in white, is Saddle. Saddle is an activated ability that you can only use as a sorcery. So unlike Crew, which you can use on defense, this is more of an offensively oriented ability. And a Saddle comes, Saddle is an ability that comes usually on, on creatures, and you basically can Crew or mount your creatures to give an extra bonus ability to the creature that has Saddle. So for example, a 2-mana 3-1. If it has Saddle 2, and it, it'll get first strike if you have saddle. So it is a nice little bonus and is a basically basically a way for your creatures to have a little added value when you're attacking. The next mechanic is plot. Plot is a new keyword where you can basically pay the mana cost up uh, the plot cost of a card up front and you don't get to cast that card right away, right? But you you pay the mana now and on the following turn as a sorcery, you get to play that card. So that allows you to set up some double spell turns. There's cards that trigger off of casting multiple spells in one turn. And it's a really interesting mechanic that allows you to kind of set up your future turns. Now, you've seen effects like this before, um, like Foretell, but with Plot, you can actually see what those Plot cards are. So your opponents can, can kind of also plan around what you're trying to do with the Plot cards. Moving on, there's Crime. Crime is anytime you affect your opponent, you target your opponent or your opponent's creatures or permanents in any way, you have committed a crime, right? So let me just read this here. Uh, if you target one or more of the following, an opponent, a spell or permanent an opponent controls, or a card in an opponent's graveyard. Once you cast a spell, activate the ability, or put the triggered ability on the stack, the crime has been committed. It doesn't matter if anything happens to the spell or ability after that point. So you can't counter your opponent's counter spell and counter the crime. The crime has already been committed. Finally, there's Spree, which is just kind of, you're gonna see Spree on a bunch of modal cards, and it basically is a way to kind of, uh, have these multifunctional cards where a card's gonna have a casting cost and then it's gonna have its spree cost. Every time you play the spree cost, 
you'll be able to get an extra ability and you'll be able to get the ability on each casting cost of the spree card. So let's say something has is a white sorcery and it has a spree cost of two colorless, give your creature plus two plus two, but then another spree effect of one colorless, untap your creature. Well, you can pay both and pay four mana to get both effects or pay three mana for one and two mana for the, for the other. So very, very flexible cards and we will see some of those coming up. But now it is time for us to get into the cards. All right, starting things off, we have another round. This is a two white XX sorcery. Exile any number of target creatures you control, then return them to the battlefield under their owner's control. Then repeat this process X more times. So I think this was pretty clearly a card that's built for constructed, right? Where if you have a lot of enter the battlefield effects, you can reset it a bunch of times and get a ton of triggers and it's gonna be awesome. Unfortunately, in limited, that's just not a thing. Most of your creatures just aren't going to have great enter the battlefield effects. I can see a world where maybe you can have a couple, but I think just given the cost of this, you're almost just never going to want to play this in your deck. So I, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Just don't play this card in your deck. It looks cool. It has a very powerful effect if you can build around it, but I'm just going to start things off here with my first Outlaws of Thunder Junction card with an F. Don't play another round in your deck. This is a sweet, sweet card to build around and construct it potentially, but not something that you want to play in limited. Moving on, Archangel of Tithes. Now this is a reprint. This card is fairly, fairly sweet. One and three white for a three, five flying angel. As long as Archangel of Tides is untapped, creatures can't attack you or planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays one for each of those attacking creatures. For each of those creatures, rather. As long as Archangel of Tides is attacking, creatures can't block unless their controllers pay one for each of those creatures. So, when you when the turn you cast this and you keep this creature untapped, it makes it really difficult for your opponents to attack you because they have to pay a mana for each of those creatures. And then, of course, when Archangel of Tides is attacking, it also makes it really hard to block. So, I mean, this card is awesome, right? It's a 4-mana, 3-5 flyer. So, really, really solid rate. One thing to note, though, is that it's triple white. So you have to be really heavy white to be able to pull off playing this card. If you want to consistently play this card, like turn four or turn five, I think you're going to need to play a mana base with like 11 planes. I mean, you can get away with 10, but it's not going to be the easiest to pull this off. But of course, the effect is quite powerful. Now, is this a slam dunk bomb? I think the only thing that puts it keeps it from being... A slam dunk bomb is the fact that it's three white. And the fact that it makes it really hard to cast means that it it'll only make it into some of your decks. So as a result, I'm going to give this a B. It's a really, you get a lot of stats and the effect is extremely powerful. But because of how hard it is to cast, I think that brings it down just a notch compared to some of the other cards that you can play. Now, this is a reprint in a set that had Devotion. So that's probably why uh, you see the triple white. If this was something like two and two white... I would definitely move it up to A tier. But I think as is, high B is where I would go with Archangel of Tides. Moving on, we have our first common, Armored Armadillo. We have Armored Armadillo. It's white for an 04 Armadillo creature. It's got a ward one. So, I mean, it's already a pretty difficult to kill creature. It's a zero, it's a one mana zero four with ward one. Uh, three and a white, Armored Armadillo gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is its toughness. So, Assuming you're not pumping this in any other way, this is basically a one mana zero four, where when you pay four mana, it gets plus four plus zero until end of turn. That's a pretty big cost though, right? That's a four mana investment to be able to turn this into a four four. It is a decent blocker, but just in general, historically, creatures without power are not cards that you're that interested in playing unless they give you value in some way. And I think it's the exact same for a card like the Armad Armadillo. Now, if you're looking to play, if if you can draft a controlling defensive deck and you need something so uh, to play early so you can survive, let's say you're plotting or uh, you're casting things on your opponent's turn, then maybe you can put this in. But I'm going to start out by saying this is probably a D-tier card, something you're not very happy with playing. If you absolutely need a defensive creature, you'll play it. But in most decks, I don't think this is a card that you want in your deck. Moving on. Another rare, Aven Interrupter. One white white for a 2-2 Flash Flyer. Pretty solid. Pretty solid. Check this card out, though. When Aven Interrupter enters the battlefield, exile target spell, it becomes plotted. 
Spells your opponents cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. So, what does this do? Well, it's kind of like this weird hybrid between, uh, I don't know if you know Spell Queller, it's like ETB, Exile Target, Spell with four mana or less, and uh, Elite Spellbinder, right? You look at their hand and you take a card. So this is kind of a um, what you would call a soft counter. So if you play some kind of a tempo strategy, you play this, your opponent plays a spell, you play this, and then you exile their spell. The only thing is, though, that they can pay two more mana to uh, replay that card, right? But that being said, the fact that, you know, at the very least, you can still flash this as a 2-2, and almost always you're going to be able to get something and tempo them out, that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. So think about, th about it this way. You pass, your opponent plays a 4 or 5 mana card, right? You play this, you basically bounce this card and put it back into exile, and for them to play it again, they're going to have to pay two more mana. So it's almost like a bounce spell, and obviously this is a card that I would be happy playing in all of my decks. Now, I don't exactly ha quite have this on the A tier because it doesn't just swing games like you would expect out of bombs, but this is definitely a card I'm happy taking early and happy playing with, so I'm going to give this card a B. It might be a low B, it might be a mid B, but be that's kind of why I don't really go into the pluses and minus necessarily for now, just because it's really early in the format, we will we'll get a much better sense for how all these cards play out after one week and everything will shift half a rank up or half a rank down. So we'll just call it a B for now. Moving on, we have Bounding Felidar. Five and a white for a 4-7 Cat Beast Mount. So six mana for 4-7, not great stats. Whenever Bounding Felidar attacks, while saddled, put a plus one plus one counter on each other creature you control. You gain one life for each of those creatures, and it's got a saddle cost of two. And as this is the first mount card, let's just read it all together. Tap any number of other creatures you control with total power two or more. This mount becomes saddled until end of turn. Again, you can only saddle as a sorcery, so you can't do this on defense. So, you get a nice trigger, right? But the problem is, it's a six mana card, and with modern magic... When you play a six mana creature, it better do something when it enters the battlefield. You just can't play vanilla six mana cards. And this kind of falls into that trap, right? There's going to be a lot of good removal. And the fact that you just get a six mana four seven body. And when you attack, sure, it's powerful. Sure, you put a bunch of plus one plus one counters on your things and you gain a life. It's a powerful effect. But because it costs six mana and it doesn't do anything the turn that it comes into play... I'm not the biggest fan of this card, and I don't anticipate this card being great unless the format somehow ends up being extremely slow, okay? So I'm going to give this card a D. And again, don't get... There's a lot of words on this card, and I think a lot of people, you open this in your pre-release, you're going to get really excited. It's an uncommon saddle creature. It, it's got to be awesome. I just don't think that that's the case for this card. You can play it, but I'm not going to be too happy about playing this in my deck. Moving on! Bovine Interve Intervention. I like the name. One in a white instant. Destroy target artifact or creature. I like that. Its controller creates a 2-2 white ox creature token. I don't like that. So, the thing with limited. In constructed, I can see this having more of an application where... Um, the threats are so powerful, it's important for you to just be able to have a cheap instant speed answer. But in limited, I mean, what, when are you casting this card? right? You're never casting this card early, right? You're casting this card super late, and when you do, it's not even a clean removal spell. And if you get to the point where you're casting this card really late, you can afford to spend four or five mana to kill a, a, kill a creature, right? What are you going to do? Kill their bear and make a bear? That's not something that you want to do with this card. So I just don't think this card is going to be very good. I think it's a card you could potentially sideboard in uh, if your opponent plays a bomb and you absolutely need to have an answer for it. But this is not a card that I'm taking early and not a card I'm particularly happy with having in my deck. I'm going to give Bovine Intervention a D. So we're starting things out pretty rough here. Lots of Ds here, but I promise it'll get better. Moving on, we have Bridled Bighorn. Three and a white for a 3-4 creature, Sheep Mount. So our first common mount creature, 3-4 Vigilance for four mana. When Bridled Bighorn attacks while saddled, create a 1-1 white sheep creature token. Saddle cost of two. Now again, you got to tap um, creatures with power two or greater to saddle, and you can only do this at sorcery speed. So not the worst, right? Four mana, 3-4 Vigilance, it's all right. 
And when it, when it attacks, you do get a 1-1 token. So you're getting something out of the deal. It's okay. Not exciting, right? It's not overstated by any means. I think it's just a fine card. You're going to put this in your deck. Obviously, you don't want a ton of fours in your deck, but this is a card that you'll get like seventh or eighth pick, and I would give this card a C. It's a card that you're going to play in most of your white decks. Moving on, we have Claim Jumper. Two and a white for a 3-3 Vigilance Rabbit Mercenary. This is a rare. When Claim Jumper enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a planes card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then, if an opponent controls more lands than you, repeat this process once. If you search your library this way, shuffle. So, let's just talk about the, mo the, like, the mode where this happens, right? The mode where this happens is going to be turn four on the draw, right? Turn four on the draw, your opponent, you know, plays their land four, plays their card. You play Claim Jumper when they have four lands in play and you have three lands in play and boom, you get to kind of ramp in growth. I'm not sure that that's especially strong, right? Then you're playing this card on turn four as a 3-3 three, three that gets you a land. Now, that's a solid card. Is it a bomb? Not necessarily, right? Now, when you play this on turn three, yeah, it's a 3-3 three, three Vigilance creature. Yeah, that's, that's a fine creature. Well, but what, what are we looking at there? A C? A C level card. So I think when people look at this card, there's a lot of words on this and it looks really exciting. But I, I'm just going to say that this is definitely going to be worse than you think it is. Because when you're on the play, you're just going to play this as a 3 3 Vigilance creature, which is fine, but nothing insane. When you're on the draw, you're not really going to want to play this on turn three. Because when you when your opponent plays their land turn three, you play your land turn three, you still can't play this card. So with the way that this card is worded, you know, you're know you very rarely going to get two lands from this as well. So I'm just looking at this as a, to get value, it's a turn four, three, three vigilance creature that puts a land into play tapped that also has the ability for you to play it on turn three. Yeah, that's a solid creature, a little bit above average, but do not take this card like it's a bomb. Do not even take this card like it's a B-level card. I would say that this is a high C for something that looks like it could potentially be better. So Claim Jumper, we're giving it a high C. Moving on. To a card that's not a high C. Dust Animus. This card is awesome. One in a white for a 2-3 spirit with flying. Two mana 2-3 flyer that's easy to cast? Sign me up. But wait, it gets better. It's got a plot cost. This is our first plot card. Plot for a one in a white. You can pay one in a white and exile this card from your hand, and you can cast it as a sorcery on a later turn without paying its mana cost. So, so let's say you play this, you plot this turn two, then turn three you can play it for free. But here's where it gets better, and here's why this is going to be our first A. If you control five or more untapped lands, Dust Animus enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters and a lifelink counter on it. So what does that mean? What that means is you plot this card on turn five, turn turn four, excuse me, for two mana. You can still play a two drop that turn if you need. Then on turn five, you play land number five. You play this, right? And you get a four or five flying lifelink creature. I mean, that's bananas. You've spent two mana to get a four or five lifelink flyer on turn five. Not to mention on turn two, you can still play this as a two mana, two, three flyer. This card is absolutely unbelievable at all phases of the game. And this is going to be our first A. Dust Animus, you are awesome. Moving on. Ariet's Lullaby. One in a white, sorcery. Destroy target tap creature, you gain two life. So this isn't an instant. Right, the instant speed nature of uh, destroy target attacking creature is pretty nice, but the fact that this is the, the fact that this card gains you life goes a really long way. I generally don't like spells that's even sorcery speed destroy target tap creature. You know, for example, uh, push pull in the previous set. I don't really like push very much. Pull was great, but I just didn't think pull gave you enough value. But add two life to that, and I mean that completely changes everything. That completely changes everything. And so Ariat's Lullaby, I think, is just going to be a solid removal spell that you're going to be playing in most of your decks. Obviously, maybe a little bit better in your controlling decks, but I just think this is a card that you're going to be taking and putting in almost all of your decks. I don't think it's absurd, but let, if you didn't have the two life on it, probably a low C. But given that you gain two life, this card is just a C 
Ariat's Lullaby, the life gain, very, very nice. Moving on, final showdown. This is our first spree card, and this card is awesome. One white. Okay, so the, at the base for spree card, the converted mana cost of this is going to be one no matter what. Or the mana value, sorry, I'm, I'm old. The mana value of this will be one. So if you have something like a card that's like counter target spell with uh, mana value one, you can actually counter this card, which is pretty interesting. But check this out. Let's start slow. So spree, the first value, if you pay one mana in addition to the casting cost of this card, so two mana, all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. Meh, not that great, right? Next ability, one mana. Choose a creature you control. It gains indestructible until end of turn. So for two mana, it's a combat trick. Your creature gets indestructible. It's all right. Maybe a D level card, C, C minus, something like that. But check this out. Three white, white, destroy all creatures. Okay, destroy all creatures. Now, generally, Wraths are decent and limited. Not insane, especially if people play around this. And this is a six mana Wrath. But the thing that makes this card awesome is you just gotta read everything about this card. Number one, Wraths are normally sorcery speed. So when you play a Wrath, your opponent can then be the first person to add a bunch of creatures to their battlefield, which makes, you know, you need to have a pretty good follow-up to the Wrath to be able to match what your opponent can do. But the fact that you can play this for three white and three colorless, for six mana, you have an instant speed wrath. That is incredible. That's already, I would say, very, very close to A-level, if not already A-level. But guess what puts this over the top? It's not the all creatures lose all abilities. It's the choose a creature you control, it gains indestructible until, until end of turn. So you're, I'm talking about for seven mana, at instant speed... You can save one of your creatures and kill everything else. It's a seven mana instant speed Doom Blast. I don't know if any of you know what Doom Blast was, but that card was completely bonkers. It was a seven mana sorcery. You get to choose a creature, everything else dies. This is a seven mana instant, and you get to save your creature. This, this is a card you want to open. This is incredible. This is the reason to draft white, to draft a white control deck. You definitely don't want to cast this card without the Wrath Effect if you can help it. You definitely want to wait, but if you do, you will get rewarded. I mean, this is the doppelgang of the set. This really is. You get to seven mana, I mean, it's going to be so hard to lose. This is likely going... I mean, we're, we're, we're like 10 cards in. This is probably going to be one of the best cards in the set, if not the best card in the set. I'll be surprised. We'll see. This card is amazing. Take it highly. Final Showdown is awesome. All right. Another rare, Fortune, Loyal Steed. Two and a white for a 2-4 body. When Fortune, Loyal Steed enters the battlefield, scry two. That's a fine card, right? Three mana, 2-4. Good defensive body, ETB, scry two. All right. I'm probably playing that in most of my decks. When Fortune attacks while saddled, at end of combat, exile it. And up to one creature that saddled it this turn... Then return those cards to the battlefield under your owner's control. It's got a saddle cost of one. So it's a three mana two four that's really, really easy to saddle. There's a lot of one one tokens in this format that we'll get to later. So very, very easy to saddle. But what this means is this creature effectively has vigilance. It doesn't need to deal combat damage. As long as you attack with this creature, right, and you saddle a creature, if it lives, you blink Fortune Loyal Steed and the other creature that you saddled with it, they both come back into play. So think about it th this way then. It's a 3-mana 2-4 with ETB Scry 2. It has Vigilance. And when you blink it and it comes back into play, you get to Scry 2 again. So every turn you get to Scry 2 as long as this doesn't die. Right? Now, it's not always going to be the case that you're going to be able to just freely attack turn 4 with your 3-mana 2-4. Right? They might just double block or what have you. But I'm saying the floor of this card is a 3-mana 2-4 Scry 2 with the ability to potentially, if you can attack and land an attack and not, not deal damage, just actually successfully attack without this dying. And let's say you can blink another creature that has uh, entered a battlefield effect, you can get a lot of value for this. So this is a card that has a pretty high floor, right? A C-level floor that potentially touches B-level upside if you can get multiple Scrys, multiple triggers out of this card. So, Fortune for me, I'm going to have as kind of a low B. I think this card is sweet. 
It's a good blocker, ETB, you get value. And if you can ever have this attack and if you can blink something or or what have you, I think this just does a lot. So something that I'm going to be very happy having in all of my white decks. Next up, Frontier Seeker. Two mana for a 2-1 Human Scout. When Frontier Seeker enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a Mount Creature card or a Plains card from among them and put it onto your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, this is a two mana 2-1 two with an ETB ability that will sometimes draw you a card, right? And obviously, the more Plains and more Mount Creatures that you have in your deck, the higher the chance that this is going to draw you a card. Now... Prior to this, I did some preparation, all right? I put this into the hypergeometric calculator, all right? So let's say you have a draft deck. You're looking at five cards. Let's say you have 12 successes in your deck. That's pretty high, right? Let's say you're playing a deck with nine planes, right? You want more planes in your deck when you have a card like this, and three mount cards. You have an 85% chance. You have an 85% chance to hit. That's pretty high. Right, but that's on the high end of things. So I think this card is going to be a card, on average, it's going to draw you between half a card to three quarters of a card, something along those lines, which is pretty fine. And it also comes attached, attached to a 2-1 body. So I think this card is pretty solid. I'm going to give this... I would say this is something like a high C. You're, all, you're always going to play this card. You are never not playing this card if you're white. But obviously it goes up or down depending on how many planes and mount creatures that you play. But I don't know that I have this quite up to the B tier level. Like a 2 mana 2 one that draws you half a card. That's kind of like a 2 mana 2 one that ETBs scries to. It's fine. So I'm going to put this around a, a C level card. With upside for being B if you have lots of planes and lots of mounts. Next we have a Getaway Glamour. Glamour? In I'm going to mispronounce a lot of things. One white for an instant spree card. So no matter what, you're going to have to pay the white. Plus one, so white mana plus one mana. Exile target non-token creature. This is any creature. Return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So you can flicker your opponent's creature or your own creature. The next part of this card, plus two mana. Destroy target creature if no other creature has greater power. So what does that mean? If there are two four power creatures on the battlefield, let's say you have one and they have one, you can still kill their four power creature because it's tied, right? But if you have a five power creature and they have a four power creature, you cannot kill their four power creature, right? So what you would need to do is actually use the first part of this card. So if you pay both parts of the spree cost, so let's say you pay white plus a colorless plus two colorless, if you pay four mana for this card, you can actually use this to exile your big creature, right? And then you can also target their smaller creature. But the way that the ordering works with this card is your big creature will get exiled and then the second part will actually happen. So if you have a 5-5 five five and they have a 4-4, four four, you target your 5-5 five five with the getaway glamour and then you target their four power creature, it'll kill it. And in a lot of instances, it'll uh, creatures, the, the power and toughness of creatures will be tied. If you're playing like a red-white deck, I'm going to assume that you have lower power creatures. So there's just a lot of flexibility with this card. Now, additionally, you can also remove two blockers out of the way, right? Think about it that way. Let's say you uh, exile their 3-3, kill their 4-4, and then you bash them, right? So there's a lot of flexibility to this card. There's a lot of words, and I know this gets intimidating, especially in your pre-release. But I would say that this card is a B. This card is a B. With all the flexibility, you can use it aggressively. You can almost always kill their biggest creature. So I just think with the flexibility and the fact that you can kill their biggest creature, not to mention you can save your creature or flicker a creature that has an enter the battlefield effect, I think all that flexibility combined gives you a very, very solid spell. Next up, High Noon. One in a white. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. My guess is that this card is mostly played for that effect, okay? That's a very unique effect. It's a very white, rare, like a rest in peace type effect, right? It's a very unique ability. But they also randomly tacked on the second ability. Four in a red, sacrifice high noon, it deals five damage to any target. So let's just ignore that first part. I just don't think that part really matters. I know there are decks later we're gonna get to where you're plotting and you're playing multiple spells in one turn, but that's not, I mean, maybe you can sideboard this card in, but we're just gonna look at the Two mana enchantment, pay five to kill any target. 
That is an awful re- uh, rate, and you have to be red and white. I'm going to give this card an F. You're just not, you just not want to pay seven mana to kill something, let alone the fact that you have to pay white and red, right? Maybe it's a low D and you cyborg it in against a deck that's really trying to play two spells in one turn. But the fact that you have to use a card just to slow your down opponents down just a little bit is really just not worth it. It really just isn't. Like your opponents still get to play all their cards, right? Sure, they don't get all the bonuses, but you're down a card on this exchange. This is just something you never want to play. Don't get um, excited by the fact that this is a rare and it's got a bunch of cool text on it. Do not play this in your deck for the most part. Probably going to be one of my favorite card names in the set. Holy cow! Two and a white for a 2-2 flash flyer. When holy cow enters a battlefield, you gain two life and you scry one. Boy, has Windrake come a long way. Back then, Windrake, two and a blue for a 2-2 flyer was a totally fine card. But magic has now evolved to the point where that is just not a card that's very desirable in your deck. So what can you add to a 3-mana 2-2 flyer to make it playable? Well, I think this checks all the boxes. It's Number one, it's got flash. That's great. There, uh, If you pair this with, for example, blue that we're going to get to later, there are a lot of cards that give you bonuses for not playing spells on your turn. So the fact that you can flash in a creature at the end of your opponent's turn, there's a lot of great additional synergies there. So I think that... The flash ability on this is actually super, super relevant. Not the fact that you're going to ambush a 1-1 and eat the 1-1. I mean, that'll happen occasionally. But just the fact that there are lots of bonuses for passing. Additionally, you get to gain two life. Like I said before, you tack gain life onto anything. Like, you're never going to play a card that's two mana gain two life or one mana gain two life. That's just a card you never, ever play. But when it comes attached to a creature, all of a sudden, boom, you get a bunch more value, right? Because it makes it that much harder to race. And it gives you a scry. So, I know the body itself isn't super strong, right? It's a 3-mana 2-2 flyer. But I think given that it has the flash and it synergizes well with blue, and the fact that you also get gain 2 life in scry 1, just, it's like, I I feel like uh, R&D was just like pushing. It's like, how many just tiny little things can we add to this that's not draw a card to make this something that's going to be a highly desired white card or a white common card that you want in your deck. And I think they they got there. I think Holy Cow, for me, is going to be one of the top white commons in the set. Even though the body isn't great, I think the Gain 2 Life, the Scry 1, and the Flash all come together well and will synergize very well with a lot of other things that we're going to see moving forward that I think I'm going to be very, very happy taking this card early. Yeah, so. Not to mention it's got a sweet name. It's an Ox Angel. What the heck? All right. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Speaking of card that works well with Holy Cow, Inventive Wingsmith. This is a two and a white for a two four dwarf artificer. At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast the spell from your hand this turn, Inventive Wings and and Inventive Wingsmith doesn't have a flying counter on it. Put a flying counter on it. So three mana for a two four body, fine, right? Three mana for a two four flyer, awesome, right? We, talk, we just talked about how Holy Cow is a 3-mana 2-2 two, two flyer. That body isn't great. But 3-mana 2-4 flyer is something you're playing all day, every day. And in the right deck, I think this card is great. I think if you're playing a color combination where you're basically just kind of tapping out every turn, um, this is not insane, right? It's, it then just turns into like a high D, low C level card. But let's say you're playing a deck that's playing things at instant speed. Let's say you have Holy Cow. You play this turn 3, turn 4, you pass. Boom, you have a 2-4 flyer, you cast Holy Cow, and now you have two flyers, and you gain life, and it's really hard to race, and you have this nice body. So I think it just works well in a lot of specific archetypes. But let's say you're playing um, an aggressive deck that wants to play creatures every turn, then this card becomes a little bit less good, just because there's not going to be as much of a window for you to actually be able to put the flying counter on this because you want to be adding to your board every, every turn. One other note that this card really works well with are plot cards, right? You play this turn three, turn four, you play a plot card, you technically haven't cast a spell. You've plotted something. So you put a counter on this, and then on the following turn, you can play that plot card. But one thing with the plot cards, though, is if you play against something really aggressive, you can fall behind because you're not adding to the board that turn. So we'll see how aggressive this format is, but as is, I think this card is very solid, decent body, a lot more defensively statted creatures in this set so far. I'm going to give this card a solid C. Moving on. 
Lassoed by the law. Three and a white for an enchantment. When lassoed by the law enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent in an opponent controls until lassoed by the law leaves the battlefield. So it's a four mana oblivion ring, kills anything. I'm in for that. When lassoed by the law enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 red mercenary creature token with tap. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. So you get a 1-1 body that... It's not even just like a 1-1 vanilla body. It's a 1-1 body that actually pumps your other creatures. And I actually think that's going to be really relevant given the fact that we've seen a lot of like X-4s, like 2-4s in this format so far. And I think having a creature that actually can help you push through some of those defensively static creatures is going to be important. So we're looking at a 4-mana kill anything spell that also gives you a 1-1 left over. This card is amazing, highly splashable, very happy card, the very uh, good card that I'd be happy first picking. This is a solid B, Lassoed by the Law. Love Lassoed by the Law. Next card, kind of funny, a very similar card. Mystical Tether, this is a common. You may cast Mystical Tether as though it had Flash if you paid two more to cast it. So this is a three-man enchantment, but you can also play it at instant speed as a five-man enchantment. When Mystical Tether enters the battlefield, exile target artifact or creature in opponent controls until Mystical Tether enters leaves the battlefield. So for three mana, you have a Banishing Light effect, your classic uh, two and a white exile target creature, right? In the last set, it was Makeshift Binding. Of course, it also had Gain Life. But this one also gives you the option to play it at instant speed. I would be shocked if this is not White's best common. This card is amazing. Three mana kill anything. Yes, please. Also, the ability to play it for five mana at instant speed to blow your opponents out at instant speed. Uh, trigger your uh, not play anything on your turn type abilities as well. This is a premium, premium white common, likely going to be one of the best commons in the set. Take it highly. This is a B level common. You don't get B level commons that often, but I do think this gets there. Maybe a low B, but I like it. Moving on, we have Nurturing Pixie. White for a 1-1 flyer. When Nurturing Pixie enters the battlefield, return up to one target non-fairy, non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. If a permanent was returned this way, Put a plus one, plus one counter on Nurturing Pixie. So, playing this turn one, obviously not that exciting. One mana, one, one flyer is not something that you want. But in the late game, let's say there's something that you want to pick up. For one mana, you get a two, two flyer that allows you to pick something up. Now, you can't play this at instant speed. The, the, that acts as like a kind of a cool trick. But the fact that you can reset something, let's say your opponent, one of your creatures has... Uh, a, a bad enchantment on it or something and you want to pick it up. I, I I don't know yet, but we'll see. Let's say there is just a bad enchantment on it. You can pick it up and put it, make a 2-2 Nurturing Pixie. And if you do that, then the Pixie is going to be okay. But the thing is, this is more of a utility creature. Um, so I think it's fine, but not something I'm super high on. I would give this kind of a low C, right? This is not something you're ever taking really early. Um, you could kind of play it in your decks, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm not taking this card too highly. Moving on. Omenport Vigilante. One in a white for a 2-2 human mercenary creature. Omenport Vigilante has double strike as long as you've committed a crime this turn. So it'll be really curious to see just how trivial it is to commit a crime. But the problem is when you play against this card you and they attack you, you just kind of assume that they're going to have a crime to commit. Right? You just kind of have to play that way because if they don't, if they if they do, then you just get blown out. Or you have to block in a way, like you have to block with your 2-4, right? To at least ensure that you can at least get the trade. So this is a really tr uh, tricky card to play around. And uh, for that reason, I just think it's a really solid bear. It's just in a lot of instances early, I think this is going to be basically unblockable. And in the late game, I mean, it can still just chunk in for a lot of damage especially if you have like cheap ways to commit crimes you're talking about just a two mana two two first uh, double striker that's just a really good value creature uh now how good do i think this card is i would say that this is this gets a high c right it's it i, I don't think it quite gets to their b level territory like i still think i'm taking mystical tether that removal spell that i looked at before over something like this but this is one of the better two mana creatures that i like to play in my deck and uh uh, you know, assuming that you can commit crimes, which again, I am not exactly sure how easy it is to do so, but look, it's a bear with upside. I like it. 
Moving on. Another white spree rare. One last job. Two and a white is the casting cost, okay? So it's pretty expensive. Plus two. So for five mana, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So it's a five mana zombify reanimate spell, which is not that great. Plus one. Return target mount or vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So if you have a mount card, a creature to get back, for four mana, you can get back a cheaper creature or a different mount card. That's okay. And plus one, return target aura or equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to a creature you control. So let's kind of run this down. The first mode, not that exciting. Five mana, return a creature into play. Okay. The four mana effect, return target mount or vehicle card. Yeah, that can be okay. Especially if there are expensive mounts and you can get ex an expensive mount back. That can be okay. I don't think you're uh, returning auras or equipments that often. So I don't think that card is especially strong. All in all, I think this card... I think where this card really becomes awesome is if you can actually spree this for two, right? If you can pay six mana, let's say, to return a creature and a mount card from your graveyard to the battlefield, then you're getting some decent value. But that's still a six mana sorcery that puts two creatures into play. I don't know how good this card is going to be. You know, so honestly for me, I don't think I'm overly excited about this card. It looks like it's got a lot of power, but I'm going to actually probably put this in the D tier. This is a, just a really expensive reanimate effect. And I just think in general, the limited is just too fast for an effect like this. It's just a very situational card that can be situationally good. But I think for the most part, it's going to be four or five mana to return a creature from your graveyard onto the battlefield. And I think that's just okay. Next card, Outlaw Medic. Two mana for a 1-3 lifelinker. If you just stopped it right there, yeah, that's fine. But check it out. When Outlaw Medic dies, draw a card. I... I can't, I don't know that I've seen this in a while. I mean, for a two mana white creature, when it dies, draw a card. I'm just all, I'm just playing that in a lot of my decks, right? And if I'm white, you're certainly playing as many copies as you can get a hold of. Now, this is obviously better in a more defensively oriented deck. If you're playing like a very aggressive deck, let's assume that the red white deck is aggressive. This card isn't as good. You're still going to take it, but... Um, the fact that it also has three toughness means it's not super easy to kill as well. But I just think this gives you a ton of value. Like if you're playing a, a blue-white Flyers deck with Holy Cows and what have you, this is just going to be the best two mana card for your deck, right? It just blocks. If it dies, you draw a card. So I think in certain decks, this card is going to be awesome and definitely a card that you're not going to cut in most decks anyway. So I'm going to give this card a C, but I like it. I like everything about this card. Two mana, one, three, lifelinker, dies, draw a card, sign me up. Next, we have another two drop in Prairie Dog. Two mana for a 2-2 two, two lifelinker. Good. At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Prairie Dog. So, I, I kind of tinted at this before. Effects that give you bonuses when you don't cast in a spell on your turn. We saw it with the Wingsmith, and we now see it with the Prairie Dog. This card is awesome. But wait, there's more. Four and a white. Until end of turn, if you would put one or more plus one, plus one counters on a creature you control, put that many plus one, plus one counters on it instead. So for five mana, you get to put an extra plus one, plus one counter on the Prairie Dog. So let's say late in the game, you play this and then the next turn happens and you pass, right? In your end step, you're going to put a plus one, plus one counter. You just pay five mana and boom, you have a four, four lifelinker, right? Yeah, I mean, it's okay. But it's just it's just added value to the fact that you're the, the the what you're looking at here is a two mana two two life linker which you're never ever cutting in any of your decks right never cutting a two mana two two life linker in any of your decks especially with how modern the speed of modern magic has been but if you're playing Prairie Dog I'm gonna keep bringing this up turn three let's say you have a Holy Cow who's gonna beat that who's gonna outrace you to turn two Prairie Dog turn three pass. You now have a 2-mana 3-3 three, three lifelinker. Then you cast Holy Cow. And all of a sudden, you have this 2-2 two, two flyer and this 3-3 three, three lifelinker in play. And you, let's just say you just continue playing flashcards. This thing can just get completely out of hand. Prairie Dog, very, very solid. Premium Uncommon. Premium Uncommon. We're talking Neighborhood Guardian Territory. This is a B. Moving on to another solid Uncommon. 
Prosperity Tycoon. Three and a white for a 4-2 human noble. When Prosperity Tycoon enters a battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with... Tap, target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Two mana, sacrifice a token, Prosperity Tycoon gains indestructible until end of turn, and tap it. So, what are we looking at here? Well, for four mana, you get a 4-2 and a 1-1. One, one. Historically, right? Historically. Anytime you pay mana and you get a creature that also comes with an extra body attached to it, when you get two creatures on a stick, it's always going to be good, right? Person of interest, inside source, printing champion, looking at all those cards. So for this one, you get a four mana fort, so you get five power and three toughness worth of stats. Not only that, that 1-1, one, one, not just a blank 1-1, one, one, it's a mercenary that you can use to pump your creatures to help force through damage against those pesky 2-mana 1-3 lifelinkers or 3-mana 2-4s, right? So that, that in of itself is very solid. I would put that in of itself into high C territory. But the fact that this also is really difficult to kill because you can sack these 1-1s, this isn't the only one that makes, this isn't the only card that makes a 1-1 token, which makes this card an excellent blocker and also just an excellent attacker as well. I'm going to say that this is a low B. I think this card just is a solid just creature on rate and something that you're going to always take and always play in your white decks. Moving on, another spree card. Requisition Raid. Initial casting cost of white. Spree, plus one. Destroy target artifact. Plus one. Destroy target enchantment. Plus one. Put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature target player controls. Now, for the sake of limited, the effect that you're going to use most often is the put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature target player controls. Now, historically, the cost of this type of effect, putting a plus one, plus one counters on all your creatures, has been more expensive than this. Usually, it's been three, maybe four mana. So, the fact that this comes tacked onto a two mana effect, that's pretty good. Especially if you're playing a deck that's looking to go wide, this is an incredible go wide payoff, right? I mean, think about it this way. Fuss Bother, Fuss, was a premium uncommon in the set. That was a three man. that was an instant, of course, but it was a three mana card and it was something that you're happy first picking, right? And that put a plus one, plus one counter on all your things and it's a three mana card. For two mana, you get to do this. Not to mention you have added flexibility here. We talked about the best white removal spells both being enchantments. So if you play against another white deck, there's a good chance you're going to have a target to kill with this card as well. So that, uh, that, that added flexibility plus the fact that if you play this in the right deck, you can kind of get a lot of value puts this at, assuming you have a lot of creatures, I would say that this is a C. I would say this is a C. I'm, I'm, I'm happy putting this in my deck. And um, even if you don't have the right deck for it, like it's a great cyborg card as well. And there's just, it's like a card that's a C, but it has the potential to be a B in the right instance. If you can get an actual artifact or enchantment, then all of a sudden this card becomes a B-level card. So pretty solid card to have. The fact that it's not an instant means that it's not really a combat trick. But like I said, if you, if you can just play a bunch of things that makes tokens... Um, this card gets much, much better. Next card, Rustler Rampage. This is another spree card with an initial casting cost of white. It's an instant. Plus one, untap all creatures, target player controls. Now, most of the time you're going to be targeting yourself, but they added target because that allows you to commit a crime. You can target your opponent. So that's nice. Plus one, Target creature gains double strike until end of turn. So that's kind of the, the most important mode of this card. It's a two mana instant that lets you give double strike to one of your creatures. It has that little bit of extra flexibility that allows you to commit a crime potentially or untap all your creatures and I guess ambush your opponent. Um, that happens occasionally. But I think this is overall a fairly weak combat trick. Doesn't give trample or anything like that. Uh, not something I'm looking to take pretty highly. And usually I like the spree cards because there's a lot of flexibility. I just don't think either modes of this card is good enough for me to want to take this pretty high. So I'm going to give this card a D. Next, Shepherd of the Clouds. Four and a white for a 4-3 Pegasus with Flying and Vigilance. All right. All right. Five mana, 4-3 Flying Vigilance. Yeah, that's fine. When Shepherd of the Clouds enters the battlefield, return target permanent card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to your hand. Return that card to the battlefield instead if you control a mount. So, if you're playing white, 
you're likely going to want to draft mount creatures in your deck. White tends to be aggressively slanted, and mount is an aggressive um, uh, keyword. So if you have a mount, the fact that you get a 5-mana 4-3 Flying Vigilance and you get to return something into play is incredible. If you don't have a mount, you're talking about a 5-mana 4-3 Flying Vigilance creature that still draws you a card, basically, right? That is awesome. This is a card I want in all of my decks. Sign me up. Value. Guaranteed 2 for 1. Sometimes you get tempo back as well because you can put this back straight into the battlefield. This is a solid B for me. Loving myself a Shepherd of the Clouds. Next. Sheriff of Safe Passage. 2 and a white for a 0-0. Zero, zero. Why would you play this card? Well, it's got a plot. Sheriff of Safe Passage enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it, plus an additional plus one, plus one counter on it for each other creature you control. So, if you were to play this just straight up three mana, it's a 1-1, one, one, right? The floor of this is a 1-1. One, one. The way that this card gets better is, of course, you wanting to set this up. So don't treat this card as uh, something that you want to play early, ever. Because even if you plot this turn two, Let's say turn three, you play a creature. This is just a 2-2. Two -two. So you do need a lot of creatures to make this card really pay off. So I'm actually curious as to how good this card is because this is one of those cards that can situationally be okay. It doesn't cost much, but the way that I look at this card is it's something that you're probably going to be plotting like turn four, right? Turn four, and then on turn five, you play another creature. Hopefully you have like, three creatures in play, and then you can play this as a 4-4, right? But there's a setup cost to this. There is, now, it is nice that the plot cost is cheap, and that's nice because it allows you to double spell or plot this and still play something on the battlefield. There is value there, but just talking, just if you're just looking at the power level of this card in general, you know, if you can play this as a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, but like you can't play a turn 3, you have to play turn 5, is that good? If you can play it as a th three mana four four like turn five, but like your creatures didn't rumble and they all still need to be on the battlefield, like there's a lot of things that I think need to go right for this card to be good. So I, I'm not taking this card very highly. It looks exciting. I would say that this is a low C. I'm just not really happy with this card. There are certain decks if you're going wide, maybe you can set this up, but I need to get beaten by this card before I'm convinced that this card is great and something that I want to take highly. Moving on, we have Stagecoach Security. Five mana for a four five. When Stage Security enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain vigilance until end of turn. So five mana, four five ETB, your creatures get a little bit bigger and they do get vigilance. It does, however, have a plot cost of four. All right, so you plot this for four. Turn five, you can play this for free. And all of a sudden, your creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. But the thing is, even if you plot this on turn four, like when you play turn five, you can't attack with this, right? So oftentimes, you're not going to really actually want to plot this on turn four, especially because this is a card that's good in a go-wide aggressive deck. You kind of just want to play a creature on turn four, and then you just want to hard cast this on turn five so that the creature that you played on turn four can also get in there and attack. So I just feel like... This is going to be the type of card that you rarely plot because, like I said, you do want a, your 4-drop to actually attack on turn 5, the turn that you play this. So given that, I think this card is just kind of a filler level card. I think it's worse than like Haas the Vigilante from the last set. I would give this card a D. Like you'll play this sometimes. You're never going to really want like multiple copies of this in your deck. Like it's, it's fine as a top-end white creature if you absolutely need it, but not something that I'm actively looking to take it. This is one of those, oh, I tabled this. Maybe I'll put it in my deck. Moving on, we have Steer Clear. Loving the name. Loving it. I'm sure Luis likes this name a lot. All right. One white for an instant. Steer Clear deals two damage to target attacking or blocking creature. Steer Clear deals four damage to that creature. Instead, if you control the mount as you cast this spell. So let's just assume you don't have a mount. Would you pay white to deal two damage or target attacking or blocking creature? I think that card is okay. Maybe like a low C level type card. Where this card really shines, of course, is if you do control a mount. And if you do draft a color combination that has access to a lot of mounts, having a one mana combat trick that can deal four damage is pretty big, right? 
is pretty big. And this is definitely a card that as you play this format a lot, you have to be really mindful of and you have to see if they have a mount to see whether or not they can deal four damage to you. Like if your opponent, if your opponent just like passes with one mana up, you're like, okay, well, do they have the steer clear, right? Do they have a mount? Can I play around it? That's something that you're going to have to be mindful of. So I would give this card a C. I think in most white decks, you're going to have a mount. It's a low C if you don't have a mount. And if you do have a mount, it's it's pretty solid. One, The difference between one and two goes a pretty long way. Often, uh, this type of effect would cost two mana to deal four damage to target attacking or blocking creature. But the fact that this is one, and if you have a mount, you can deal four, that's pretty solid. I wouldn't want too many of this card in my deck, though, honestly. I'd be happy with one, maybe two. But like once you get to like three steer clears, I would steer clear of this card in my deck. Um, I might edit that one out. All right, moving on. Sterling Keykeeper. Two mana for a 2-2 two -two human mercenary. It's a bear. Uh, if, it, if I've learned anything about Murders at Karlov Manor, if it's a bear with an ability, I'm probably playing it for the most part. We'll see. Two mana for a 2-2 two -two human mercenary. Two mana, tap, tap target non-mount creature. So, you know, two mana, 2-2, two -two, it's a bearer. It's not great. There are definitely more defensively statted creatures in this format, right? In Murders at Karlov Manor, the turn three drop that your opponents played were, all, were basically three mana, 2-2s. Two -two and here so far, we're seeing some 2-4s. We're seeing some more defensively static creatures, so uh, I don't know that bears are as good as it was in the last set. I mean, this was the, this is the case in any format that has morphs or disguised creatures. Like, bears just end up being a lot better. So, as is, I just think the tap ability is kind of expensive. It's not something that you're ever using early. Uh, it is a way to commit a crime, so there is upside there. But again, it's just a very expensive effect, but the fact that it comes on a 2-2 body makes it fine. Not taking this card too highly, I would give this card a low C, high D, something along those lines for Sterling Keykeeper. Moving on, another Sterling card, Sterling Supplier. Four to white for a 3-4 flyer. It's a bird soldier. When Sterling Supplier enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on another target creature you control. I would have much preferred me to be able to put a plus one, plus one counter on any creature because... Having a 5-mana 4-5 flyer at a common would be awesome. That being said, you're getting decent stats for this, right? It's a 5-mana 3-4 flyer that gives you 4 power and 5 toughness worth of stats, but 3 and three power and 4 toughness of that comes attached to a body. So um, I think this is just a fine card to play at the top end of your mana curve. I think it's kind of uh, right up there. What was the name of the card? I saw, uh, Stagecoach Security. It's kind of in that realm. Stagecoach Security also being a five mana card that you can kind of play. So it's like you can play the Security, you can play the Sterling Supplier. They're kind of interchangeable. Uh, I think this card might be a little bit better, especially if you're not going wide, um, but nothing too 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 fantastic. In, in in Magic a long time ago, I would love this card, but given how the formats have evolved, I just think this card is okay filler in your deck. Probably a low C for me for Sterling Supplier. Moving on. Take up the shield. One in a white for an instant. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. It gains lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. This is an awesome, awesome combat trick. Again, uh, the fact that this card gives lifelink is huge. The fact that it gives you a plus one, plus one counter is huge, right? Your creature can't die. You get, you get a nice big life swing in the exchange and you get something to you know, something that stays left over. Now, this doesn't make your creature big enough to attack through things a lot of the time, right? So if you're playing against a green deck with much bigger creatures, then obviously this card isn't great. But as far as combat tricks goes, I mean, if your opponent's casting removal spells, like the fact that this, the fact that this counters a removal spell and also gives you lifelink and the plus one, plus one counter, I mean, this has been a premium card in the past. This definitely is a lot better than it looks because you're just like, oh, two mana for a plus one, plus one? Is that really great? But like I said, you tack on lifelink, you tack on indestructible to this, and you're looking at a top tier combat trick and definitely a card for me that's going to make the top five of the white commons in this set for me. So I like this card. Uh, I would take it pretty highly. Definitely happy having at least two copies of this card in all of my white base decks. Maybe even three. This card is good. Very good. Take it high. 
All right, moving on, we have Thunder Lasso. Two and a white for an artifact equipment. When Thunder Lasso enters the battlefield, attach it to target creature you control. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one. All right, not great, but when equip creature attacks, tap target creature defending player controls. So the nice thing about this card is, yeah, you play a two drop and then you play this turn three, boom, all of a sudden, it's it's kind of like a, a pseudo removal spell. Every time you attack, right? Every time you attack, you get to just remove their biggest creature from the uh, from the battlefield and continue to attack. So that gives that puts a lot of pressure. If you're an aggressive deck, I think this card can be very solid. One other thing to keep in mind that makes this card better than it would be in other formats is the fact that when you do this, you are committing a crime, right? This is a repeatable free way to commit a crime, and I think that definitely elevates the stock of this card. Whereas in other formats, maybe this card is okay. But in this format, because you're able to commit a crime every turn, let's say you pair this with black or or or, or blue where you get some bo uh, benefits from committing a crime, this card is great, right? We'll see some cards later down the line. So I think this deck, this card has got gets a lot because you can commit the crime. So I would, I would normally I, I would not be that thrilled. Like I just haven't been, like equipments have just, super underperformed right over the past few sets so i wouldn't be super excited about this but given that you can commit a crime every turn you can tap something out of the way i'd give this card a c maybe it's a high c i'm not sure i'll, I'll have to play with it a little more like the thing is you're still not getting great combat stats out of this right like let's say you're on the back foot and you have thunder lasso like you're pumping your creature up plus one plus one but you can't attack so you really have to be aggressive but in an aggressive deck I think it can be a card that can that can do some work. Moving on, we have Trained Erynx. One in white for a 3-1 Cat Beast Mount. So this is the common mount creature. When Trained Erynx attacks while saddled, it gains first strike until end of turn, scry one. So this is a solid, solid two drop. So, you know, oftentimes the problem with a two mana 3-1 is sometimes your opponent just makes a 1-1 one, one token and you can't attack through it and that becomes problematic. Well... This card, you get to solve that problem because you can saddle and it makes this creature extremely, extremely difficult to play. And if you're playing an aggressive deck, this is the creature that you want, right? Earlier, we had the two mana, one, three lifelinker when it dies, draw a card. But if you're playing an aggressive deck, you probably want to take this card instead, right? Because this is a two mana, very, very aggressively static creature. Two mana, three, one with first strike when you attack, right? Porcelain Legionnaire, anybody? Okay, it's not Porcelain Legionnaire, but I think in an aggressive deck, this card is awesome. And not only that, like don't underestimate the Scry effect. That's also a very, very strong addition that I think that was like a knob that they added to, to kind of juice the power level of this card. I think this card is great. If you're aggressive, you can't have too many copies of Trained Erynx in your decks, unless there's a bunch of like one damage type effects in this format. So I'm going to give this card a C. Very, very happy to have this in my aggro decks. Moving on, Vengeful Townsfolk. Two and a white for a 3-3 three, three human citizen creature. You don't get that that often, right? A three mana 3-3 three, three in white, but here we are. It's a three mana 3-3 three, three creature. Whenever one or more other creatures you control die, put a plus one, plus one counter on Vengeful Townsfolk. So this is just a really solid body, right? Three mana 3-3 three, three creature. Like, I think you're just going to play this in most of your white decks for the most part. Uh, I could be wrong. But all you need is one creature, one of your creatures to die to have this card be good, right? Because let's say you play a two drop and then you play Vengeful Townsfolk and you attack, they just, they just don't want to trade with you, right? And if, like I said, if you ever just lose a creature or block or chump a creature, all of a sudden you're looking at a three mana four four. That's a lot of stats. That being said, your opponents can loosely play around this and it's still a three mana three three. I think this card is still pretty fine though. Um, I'm not going to take it super highly. I'm not taking over the removal spells. I'm probably not even taking over the trained Erynx, but hey, if I'm drafting a white deck, I'm still probably taking this. So I'm going to give this card, you know, uh, it's a C-level card for me. I'm going to play this in most of my white decks. Like I said, it doesn't take much. Like if, if there's a sacrifice element, if you can sack a creature and turn this into 4-4, four, four, that's great. But like I said, if you can just get the one counter on this, I think it's fine. And if you don't, it's still a three mana three three. It trades with everything early, right? What more can you ask for? So for a common at least. So I think this card is pretty decent. And 
To round things off here, we have Wanted Griffin. Three and a white for a 3-2 flyer. When Wanted Griffin dies, create a 1-1 red mercenary creature token with tap. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So the one issue with this card is you don't get the 1-1 body right away, right? You get the body after this card dies. But it's it's okay. I mean, Griffnot Tracker is a 4-mana 3-2 in the previous set, and it was really bad. It was a card you really did not want to play. And at least with this card, when you play it, you can trade with another 3-power creature, and you can still get a 1-1 to show for it. But that being said, 4-mana for a 3-2 flyer just doesn't rumble all that well. And so, like, g- given how bad the tracker was in the previous set, like, this gives you that 1-1 one, one body, and that's nice. Um, given just how poor the stats are for this, just, like, having the 2 toughness, makes me not like it as much as you would think. As much as you would think. So, I still would give this a C, but not a high C or even a mid C. I would give this kind of a, a low C. I'm not taking this super highly, but it's... um. It's something that you can still play in your decks. I mean, it's going to make it into most of your decks. It's going to be like your 18th or 19th best card in in your white decks. All right. So that does it for the um, the main set cards. We're going to get over to the bonus sheet cards, though, right? We're going over all the white cards. So moving on here, we're going to have the big score cards. These big score cards have are all mythics. They're all standard legal. Uh, The reason why they're mythic is because uh, I think they wanted it to match the relative rarity or like how often you're going to see these cards in draft. So some of them might not even feel mythic, but because of how rare they are, um, they put all of them at mythic level. So let's take a look at them, right? Collector's Cage, one in a white, hideaway five. When this artifact enters a battlefield, look at the top five cards in your library. Exile one, face down, then put the rest on the bottom in a random order. Okay. One colorless tap. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Then, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. Wow. Now, keep in mind, you can put this counter at instant speed. You can, so you can use it as an instant speed combat trick. Imagine playing around this. Right, your opponent attacks you with a bunch of things, and you just have this in play, or you're, you're you're trying to attack them, and they have this in play. You just can't play defense. It's just like you have to play around a guaranteed combat trick for one mana. Not to mention, this is a repeatable effect. Right, three mana put a counter. Next turn, put a counter. Right, every turn, one mana put a plus one plus one counter on any creature you control. That is already a solid magic card that I'm playing in my decks, and it is not hard to trigger the hideaway condition for this card because you can move the counters on all a bunch of things. And when you do, you get to cast a spell for free? Are you kidding me? Like, I would already play this card at one white, one tap, and put a plus one, plus one counter target creature. That's already a card I would play. And the fact that you get to play a card for free once you meet the conditions of this card, this card's awesome. Now, I will say, if you're behind on board, like, obviously... um, This takes a little bit of time to get going. That being said, the amount of value that you can get out of this card, right? And the fact that this card just is going to be unbeatable in a lot of board states. I'm going to give this card an A. This card is awesome. I want to open Collector's Cage and I want to play with it. You're going to be able to like just put like three counters on things and get a free creature. And just every turn you're like, oh my gosh, another plus one, plus one counter. It's not like you lose this artifact when you play the creature, right? You get to just keep activating this ability. So Collector's Cage is incredible. Let's see if the other big score cards can match this card. I don't know that they will. Grand Abolisher. (laughs) Okay, so this is a reprint. White, white for a 2-2. Human Cleric. During your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. So I will say there are matchups where this is relevant, right? The matchups where your opponents are trying to cast spells on your turn, this is solid. But in a lot of matchups, this card just doesn't do that much, right? Not to mention the fact that this is a difficult to cast card. It's a white, white for a 2-2. It doesn't even have first strike, right? So it's just like a bear that's really hard to cast that sometimes can be useful. So because of all of that, because of how hard it is to cast and how underwhelming the stats are 
I think this card's a D. I think it's got upside to be a C in if you're playing a deck with lots of planes that makes it easier to cast. And I think in matchups where like this tax ability actually is relevant, it can be better. But it's easy enough to just play your removal spell main spell uh, 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 main phase anyway. So I don't think this card is especially exciting. And again, this is a card that doesn't feel like a mythic, but it is. But um, I mean, it might have some constructed applications, but yeah, not as exciting as that last one that we saw. Let's look at that one again. Okay, I feel good about it. All right, moving on. Next card, Old Tech Matter Weaver. Two and a white for a 2-4. Whenever you cast a creature spell, choose one. Create a 1-1 one, one colorless gnome artifact creature token or create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control. Now, I'm not sure how many different artifact tokens you can make in this format specifically. I think it's a cool build around in some other formats, right? If you can copy clues or whatever, that's also pretty cool. If you can copy big artifact tokens, that's also pretty cool. But even looking at the floor of whenever you play a creature, you get a 1-1 one, one token. For a three mana two four, that's already a pretty solid body, right? I'm happy to have this. And you're you're never cutting this card, right? You're going to be playing creatures, and every time you do, you get an artifact. So this is something that I'm happy playing. It's not a bomb, but it's a good card. It's a B. I'm going to take Old Tech Matter Weaver very highly and be very for happy to first pick this card and play it in all my white decks. Moving on, rest in peace, graveyard hate card. I don't. I mean. Most of you probably know what this card does, but let's read it. One in a white for an enchantment. When Rest in Peace enters a battlefield, exile all graveyards. If a card or token would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. This is the ultimate anti-graveyard card. It's going to be uh, really, really solid against the Aftermath Analyst Teamer Control deck in Standard. But in Limited, this is a big zero. This is an F. Do not take Rest in Peace. This card stinks and it does nothing. All right. So that is the big score cards. We're now going to get into the kind of the bonus sheet cards. Now, these are the cards, if you're familiar with the card, the bonus sheet cards in MKM, these are cards that are not standard legal, but are cards that are going to spice up limited. And man, some of these cards are awesome. Some of these cards, you're going to lose to it and you're going to be like, why, why did they do this? Why did they do this? Let's see if some of those cards exist in white. So moving on. Fell the Mighty. It's a little hard to see the casting cost there. It's four and a white for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures with power greater than target creature's power. So a very situational sweeper. I just feel like if I want a sweeper, I want a sweeper that I can control. And I don't want a sweeper that situationally just does nothing. Or that's pretty bad. So I'm not excited to take this card. I would say that this is a D. There's times when it can be a B. But I'm not looking to take this and try to use my brain power to make this like if you have a deck with like a bunch of two power creatures i guess you can use it to kill a bunch of big things maybe it's a cyborg card if your opponent's playing a deck with a lot of large creatures but not something i'm looking to take highly so first one was a miss next one fierce retribution one in a white instant destroy target attacking creature cleave five in a white you may cast a spell for its cleave cost. If you do, remove the words in the square brackets. And the words in the square brackets in this is attacking creature. So what this means is for five and a white, you can kill anything, which is a pretty inefficient removal spell. But for one and a white, you can destroy target attacking creature at instant speed, which has always been fine. It's a solid card. So you combine the two. I would give this a C. It's a fine card. You know, remember not on my watch in the last set. It's kind of like that. It's a little bit better because you can kill anything for six mana, but six mana is still a lot. So not something I'm still overly excited about. But because you have that added flexibility, obviously it's better than a card like not on my watch. Maybe it's a C, high C, somewhere along those lines, but uh, not super exciting. All right, moving on. Journey to Nowhere. All right, this is a nice removal spell. One in a white. When Journey to Nowhere enters a battlefield, exile target creature. When Journey to Nowhere leaves the battlefield, return, to the ex return the exile card to the ba battlefield under its owner's control. So unconditional removal for creatures for two mana. Sign me up. This is a very hard, solid B that you're going to take. One of the best removal spells in the format if you can get this. This card is amazing. Next up, Leyline Binding. 
another removal spell. It's kind of interesting that they printed another enchantment-based removal spell, but five and a white, Leyline Binding, you should know this. It's a standard powerhouse. Flash. So it's a flash removal spell. This spell costs one colorless less to cast for each basic land type among lands you control. When Leyline Binding enters a battlefield, exile target non-land permanent in opponent controls until Leyline Binding leaves the battlefield. So, in most instances... This means that in your average two-color deck, this is going to be a four-mana instant speed way to exile anything. And the added flexibility here, right? This doesn't just kill creatures, it kills anything, right? That added flexibility is extremely relevant because you get to kill your opponent's Journey to Nowheres or your opponent's uh, various Banishing Light type effects. And for that reason, I'm going to give this card a B as well. Every now and then, you're playing a three-color deck and you can cast it for three, but just a four-mana instant speed way to exile anything is just a very solid removal spell, and I'm happy to have this in any of my decks. Moving on, Pariah. Two and a white. Enchantment Aura. Enchant Creature. All damage that will be dealt to you is dealt to Enchanted Creature instead. So this is kind of a like a really weird removal spell. Basically, the idea is you want to put Pariah on one of your opponent's creatures, and when you do, when they attack you, all that damage gets redirected to one of their creatures. So it makes it really tough for them to attack, but they don't have to attack, right? And you're down a card on the exchange until they feel like they're ready to attack and then find a way to get rid of their creature. So, it, and the thing is that creature can still block, Right, the creature can still block. So for that reason, I just don't think this card is very good. I'm gonna give this card a D. I just don't really want to play Pariah on my decks. I think there might be decks where like this can be okay as a cyborg card, but I'm not too excited about Pariah in any of my decks. Ooh. Speaking of something that's interesting, I I'm really curious what you think about this card. Path to Exile. We all know what this does. One white for an instant exile target creature. Its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put that card onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. So, extremely cheap and efficient removal spell. But, how good is it? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, this is not an A. I don't even know that this is a B. And here's why. You're never casting this early, and your opponent's still getting something out of the deal. Right? Your opponent is still getting something out of the exchange. Think, think Assassin's Trophy from the last set. You could get Assassin's Trophy. And that card kills anything. Also gives them a land. And it gives them the land, um, I believe, untapped. And that was also a card I never took highly. Not because... And part of it is you can't cast it early. And because if you cast it early, you're, giving, you're ramping them, right? If you ramp them, they have an even higher likelihood that they're going to beat you. So you kind of cast this late as a way to kill something. And if you do, then it's a it's a removal spell. But the thing is, there's almost always something your opponents can do with the mana that you give them. So any type of removal spell, and I mean, bovine intervention is exactly the same way. Anytime you have a removal spell where you give your opponent a resource, limited is all about the resources, right? It's all about kind of, like in just a lot of instances, it's about who has the most resources. How many two for ones? Did you blow your opponent out? Did you get a two for one here? Did you get a two for one there? Were you able to draw enough cards to out resource your opponent and win with the last threat? There's just a lot of games that come down to that, right? The person who better navigated their games and got more value out of their cards wins. Well, Path to Exile gives them the land. So for me, I'm gonna give this card a C. I'm gonna give this card a C. This might be controversial. People might be like, you're crazy. One white, kill anything. Put it in my deck all day, every day. But I, I'm going to look elsewhere. I would rather take uh, Journey to Nowhere. I would rather take the common uh, Banishing Light effect over something like a Path to Exile because I like Unconditional Removal that doesn't give my opponent a card. Still fine, but not awesome. Not as good as most people think, I think. And that's it. We did the go around and there you have it, folks. That was all of the white cards. Definitive, definitive limited guide for all the white cards. Maybe I'll go back and see just how wrong I was about those cards. But um, yeah, that was pretty fun. That was pretty fun. White looks pretty solid. Uh, one thing that I noticed, though, is that there's not that many commons that are like straight Fs anymore. So just, it's really hard to just have a deck that doesn't have enough playables, but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in white. Uh, we'll note that there's not really any 
that many ways to go wide, right? I can't think of too many commons that just ETBs and made a bunch of tokens. So I think the way that white's going to play is going to be a little bit different. I think white still wants to be aggressive with the saddle cards that you saw, right? If you play the trained Erinx, you can definitely draft an aggressive white deck, but it's going to be a little bit different, right? You're playing creatures, you're saddling up, you're getting in for individual creatures instead of getting in with just a bunch of creatures and then casting like an inspired charge effect or an on the job or something like that to kind of get in for uh, a bunch of damage. And honestly, I think that's kind of refreshing. Hopefully that's going to be the case just because I think all of us are a little bit sick of dog walkers and inside sources and person of interest into, you know, fuss bother on the job. So I I'm excited to see kind of how white plays out. So top five white commons for the set. All right. Coming in at number five for me is going to be the trained Erinx. Um, the reason why I have it at five is, you know, it's not a card that's as good on the draw. It's a very good card that's aggressively slanted. But if you're on the back foot and if you're also playing a defensively slanted deck, I don't think it's quite as good. But I think it's a solid card that you're going to want a bunch of copies of in your aggressive white decks. Coming in at number four, take up the shield. Take up the shield is a fantastic combat trick, something that I'm just really, really happy playing in, in all of my decks. I could actually be a little bit too low on this card. It could actually be number three. Uh, but I have it at number four for now. Uh, maybe it's just because... I always tend to undervalue combat tricks, even though I know I shouldn't. This is probably number three, but I have it at number four just because I like number three. Number three gives you a lot of value. Number three is Outlaw Medic. So that's one in white for a one three. It's a one three lifelinker. And um, when it dies, it draws your card. I just think this card just gives you a lot of value and you're happy having it. And I just feel like this is a card. If I have three copies of it, I'm not going to complain. So I'm happy with that. Coming at number two, we have Holy Cow. Uh, I think just face value, this card is just very, very solid. You get a lot of value out of this card. Two and a white for a 2-2 flash fly flyer that gains you two, scries you one. You just got to love it. You just got to love it. I know the body isn't great, but you get the two life back. If it didn't give you the two life, it would be so much worse. But I like the fact that it gives you the life. It allows you to draft kind of a sky style strategy and race your opponents, especially in conjunction with Outlaw Medic, right? Outlaw Medic into Holy Cow. You, you have a life linker on the ground and then you get to start attacking with your flyer. And it plays really well with the pass. Don't play something on your turn and play something on your opponent's turn. I think that's going to be super important. But number one, it's going to be Mystical Tether. Mystical Tether is just great. Three mana, kill any creature. Five mana, instant speed. Also allows you to blow your opponents out in combat. H having Giving white the ability to kill something at instant speed for five mana while also unconditionally killing something at three this card is fantastic and uh, the first B-level common that we've seen so far. So there's a the top five. There you have it. Outlaws of Thunder Junction, set limited review for white. Now, if you've enjoyed this content uh, and wanted to support the channel in another way, I did launch my Patreon channel. Shout out to all the current patrons. The link is in the description below. We've spent a lot of time in the Discord just going over the cards already. Uh, and we're going to continue doing so. And we're going to just kind of have this giant brain as we play the pre-releases and stuff. We're all going to be talking and learning and bringing each other up. So uh, by joining the Patreon, you will get access to the Discord where I think a lot of people are, are just leveling up and learning the format as we go. So there you have it, folks. We're going to have five more videos of this. This was the first. We're starting at white. We're going to have blue, black, red, and green and gold. And hopefully all these, the plan is to have all these videos out prior to the pre-release so that you'll be better equipped to build the perfect decks and win all of the booster packs. Win all of the booster packs in your pre-release or drafts, um, depending on what you have. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Feel free to hit the like or subscribe button for more daily videos just like this. I'll see you tomorrow.